showed a lot of clips from Testament, but he also went his own way and surprised us many, many times in that performance, uh, which inspired me to read Ode to Gaiety, by the way, Jason, thank you. <laughs> um, so let's watch Testament. Uh, you'll see at the beginning that his film students went out on the street and tried to interview people in Modesto to say, have you ever heard of James Brown? And most of them hadn't. Um, and then he thought he was going to recap his, his life and his filmmaking career. So you'll see uh, quotations in the Testament from a bunch of his uh, earlier films. I think at that point, um, maybe he had made 10 films or 10 or 12. Anyway, let's watch it and see what we have to learn. And I'm going to ask you, after we watch Testament, while we're coming up to the stage, to turn to somebody near you, uh, preferably somebody you don't know, but it doesn't matter, uh, and say something about what you learned from watching this film about James Broughton, and whether you learned from watching this film anything about yourself. Let's try it. Okay, please turn to someone near you and have a short conversation about what you learned from watching this film about James Brown, and maybe if you learned anything about yourself. And Jess and Corey, could you please join me? just saying how much fun it is to actually watch a, a film on a big screen. Um, these, many of James's films are actually available on YouTube. So you can watch all the ones that don't have a lot of nudity. Uh, we put them on YouTube for free. So uh, as part of the Big Joy uh, project, wanted to bring James's work back into this world because to me it seems more valuable than ever. Um, I'll just briefly introduce myself and then I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves in the context of uh, how they knew James. So um, I'm Stephen Silla and uh, have been a newspaper reporter, a facilitator, and a sometime futurist and um, have lived on this island for 40 years. And in 1989, I went to a radical ferry gathering at Brighton Bush Hot Springs, where I happened to be assigned to the same cabin with James Broughton and Joel Singer. And um, James became a friend and mentor. And after he died in 1999, I decided I wanted to do something to bring his work back into the world. Since I was a writer, I thought I would write a book. 
but I was convinced by Mark Thompson, who was an author and an amazing friend of James, that it should be a film. James, after all, made 23 films, and um, that's the best source material to tell his story. And Mark was absolutely right, even though jumping off the cliff into filmmaking, which both of these people have done a lot longer than I have, um, was kind of a gulp experience. Uh, nonetheless, knowing James uh, was one of the most important things in my life. And uh, even though I only knew him for the last 10 years of his life, uh, Corwin Fergus, also known as Cordy, uh, is a Jungian analyst and filmmaker who knew James well at the San Francisco Art Institute. And I'll let you tell that story. Um, so I uh, first met James uh, about three years after the film we just watched, Testament. And um, I was uh, in my first semester as a um, graduate film student at the San Francisco Art Institute. And uh, <clears throat> early on that fall, James had a uh, retrospective showing of his films. And I had seen one of his films, uh, I think a year and a half before that, at uh, all places, the Bellevue Film Festival, my very first time in Seattle. I stumbled upon the Bellevue Film Festival, which in the 70s was one of the uh, top independent film festivals. Um, and uh, I was so taken by uh, James's um, films that night, and the whole evening was um, a little bit of a performance piece. James came out, I think, three or four different times in different costumes and <laughs> regaled the crowd with uh, a lot of insight and humor, and um, and I just really was so taken with him. Somebody mentioned that uh, night um, this uh, book on filmmaking that he had written, which I didn't see outside. It's a little book called Seeing the Light. I'm not even sure if it's still in print. It's a really lovely um, little book, and. Uh, um, so I went uh, <clears throat> sort of straight to the um, uh, film department and uh, looked into whether I could uh, uh, fill my TA, teaching assistant, um, thing by uh, teaching with James. And so I uh, looked up James and hit it off with him. And, um, and I was a TA for three years at uh, his filmmaking courses. The first two years were um, uh, three weekend events in Sonoma County, uh, this beautiful uh, piece of property, many acres out in the, the hills, and, um, and each uh, <clears throat> weekend was uh, a little bit, uh, had the flavor of the end of the film. There was lots of costume making, it was very ritualized, it was uh, we would uh, periodically sit in a circle arranged um, astrologically and talk, and then we would um, make art do ritual. And uh, there wasn't, you know, a, a speck of technique or learning film wise. And these were all undergraduate, mostly undergraduate film students, but people from other departments too, uh, who I think just. Uh, and we learned so much about the spirit of art, and it was a really a great uh, pleasure to um, get to do that with James. I had um, studied a lot of uh, Jungian psychology and um, Eastern religion and mystical traditions as an undergraduate, so uh, James and I kind of had that language to speak. He'd done a, a really extensive long Jungian analysis in the uh, 60s and early 70s, which uh, if you kind of know what to look for, you can see a lot of the influence uh, uh, from that in his later work. And, um, and he was just a, a real uh, joy to, um, to know and be with. Uh, I think his uh, um, kind of lightness and gaiety and joy to be really, I think, kind of clearly uh, come through. I think uh, 
He was a very deep, very dark person also, or had gone through so much. And I, I think that was the thing that I uh, most got from James, was um, just blending these, or able to relate these two sides of my personality, one which was pretty fun-loving, and the other one was very dark and broody, and, and um, uh, just being with James, talking with James, uh, really uh, taught me a lot about that. And another uh, book that I saw that was out there that um, was hugely influential for me at that time was his Androgyne Journal, um, which kind of is a little bit in the Jungian tradition of active imagination and uh, is, um, I think, just a, uh, um, a really, uh, you know, great work, uh, again, of the coming together of two sides of the personality, I think, in that work, particularly the masculine and feminine, I, I think, uh, um, one of the things that is maybe, I think, a little bit underappreciated about James is that he's, in my feeling, a great um, uh, nature spirit. And it just kind of his uh, love affair with creation itself, particularly the earth, and um, the way that that is, I think, kind of intertwined with the body get a very good sense of, in a lot of his films, for sure, but also in the Andrew John Journal. And I think uh, George Kuchar says that same thing about the nature spirit in the Big Joy film. Uh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Janice Finley, this is amazing, by, by the way, because we haven't actually met before today, uh, produces and directs experimental narrative film and live stage work, which is really interesting to me. Uh, in the Northwest. She's an instructor of film history and film music history at the Seattle Film Institute. So tell us how you know James. Um, I'm actually not quite sure the date or anything. I, I don't remember you moved quite. moved to Port Townsend in 89. Okay, I'm, th I'm thinking 89, 90. Um, and, I, and it was started out with a phone call and I can't quite remember if James called me or I called him. Uh, at that time, I was uh, running a film series that was basically short art films late at night uh, at a place called New City Theater, which is now the Richard Hugo House location um, in Seattle. And uh, I think maybe Cordy even had told James about my film series. Uh, uh, and James was wondering if I wanted to show some of his work or do a show of his. Um, and what was tough was he was getting older by this time and I, my, my series was late night. So uh, we couldn't quite figure out any way to really have him come because it was just so late for him when he lived up in Port Townsend. Um, and then I think things kind of developed between us more when he started seeing some of my work. Uh, that was on PBS, and then I came to Port Townsend in 93 with a film. And what was, <coughs> was unusual, <coughs> excuse me, uh, was that he, f he thought perhaps I had seen a particular film of his, um, because my film and the film he had made much earlier, they had these really strong similarities, even though I'd never seen the film. Um, and this kind of led to, I guess, conversations between us where it just felt like we had some sort of, I don't know, maybe many, I don't know, maybe many people felt this with him, but I, I just felt like I had this real spiritual connection with him. Um, probably his book or writings that's most affected me uh, is his autobiography, which is, I think, coming, coming unbuttoned, unbuttoned um, which when you see devotions, there is a little shot of him sort of coming unbuttoned, which, uh, and I think it just sort of blew me away, sort of the same thing that Courtney's saying about James. Um, James came from very dark things 
in his family from very young age, just absolutely bone crushing sadness in like how he, his father died when he was five. And his mother basically blaming him for the death uh, because he had the uh, Spanish flu and his father caught it. Who knows if it was from him or who it was from and died. Um, so he grew up with the weight of that, his sole parent not really loving him. Uh, and so what I found so remarkable about James was a man who chose joy out of life. And it's no small thing to be this person that's so integrated uh, darkness with light. Um, and he truly integrated them. And many conversations I would have with him were, as he aged, how very difficult things would happen to him, like having, doing a poetry reading and suddenly having what are called TIAs, trans-ischemic episodes, I think, or accidents maybe is what it stands for. It's like little mini strokes and he suddenly was blinded as he was doing his poetry reading. It was temporary, but he had to face like, I can never do this again. Um, so he would, he's like a person that was not like a phony optimist, at all, just a man coming out of reality that was often very dark and literally choosing to be joyful and happy um, in a, a true way, I think. Um, I also really found him, I mean, when I describe this, a mentor as a human being, but also as an artist. And I think that was one of the ways we also really connected uh, was just things he would tell me about his life as an artist and also aging as an artist. Um, it, I don't know, I, I just um, found him to be one of the most, um, I don't know, meaningful people I've ever met. I just really, one of the fun things for me watching his films is hearing his voice again and seeing his face. I love seeing his, him growing younger, like in Testament, um, till he's a little boy or a little baby. Um, but yeah, I found him tremendously inspir inspirational on these levels that I've mentioned. Um, I also love that some of his poetry works like an earworm. You know, when you hear a song that you can't get out of your head. And, his poetry is like that. I, I love how his films uh, reflect his, or part of his poetry. Um, uh, and I first um, came across him when I was in college in a film class and they sh my teacher showed us the bed. And I never forgot it, you're gonna see it today. Um, it's so interesting to think of the time period he, when he made it where it had to be as Stephen pointed out in his documentary on, on James, how it had to be shot after hours in like a lab that did porn films. Uh, it seems much tame, you know, tame to us maybe now, but uh, this guy really, uh, I don't know, just was pushing the envelope in so many ways. And, and I think another thing about him, he just wasn't afraid to reveal himself in his poetry, in his films, uh, risking uh, everything. Trying not, he wasn't trying to be cool. He wasn't trying to have a facade of, I'm such a great artist or something like that. It just risking embarrassment, risking failure, just risking it all. Um, that's another, I, I don't know, I just love that bravery about his work. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, thank you. Let's just briefly talk about Testament and then give a preview of coming attractions and we'll watch the other three films and, and then we'll come back up. Um, so Testament, is there anybody who could grab that mic out there? Because I'm interested in wh whether anything that came up for all of you um, is, is interesting. What, what came up for you watching it this time? Wow. Um, or Cordy, either can you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I love the, I love him in the rocking chair on the on the beach, uh, at the beginning and the end. It's so primal and so 
surprising, not what you would think of, I don't know, anyone doing. <laughs> I, I just sort of love it, and I love him wearing red um, in the films. And, and he made those weird. little videos, like the, the girl with the beady black eyes, you know, that was an early music video in a way, of, with his own poem. Uh, yeah. And I, I kept thinking that if he were around with YouTube, he would be making these little <laughs> poetic, poetic videos all the time. Uh, and the girl, girl with the beady, beady black eyes, we've actually put the big joy has put on YouTube as a as a poetry video. Um, I also love the the funeral uh, procession that he has for himself 25 years before he died, uh, <laughs> with his students through the streets of Modesto, and then going to the grave of his ancestors and laying down with that beautiful cape that's now out in the the lobby, which I recommend you take a close look at. <laughs> I was um, a little bit taken, I uh, took this opportunity in the last couple days to um, look at some of James's other films and um, I think there, uh, he makes the, um, I think the kind of the films, some of the same films over and over again and they end up being completely different and I was, uh, struck by, I think, um, a similarity between um, this film and uh, um, The Bed and, and, um, and Testament that you'll see, and uh, um, Scattered Remains is also kind of like, scattered remains like, also. like yeah. Testament, it's the one he did with Joel, yeah. but yeah, interesting. So any reflections that anybody wants okay. to mention here? Watching the film was so uh, integrative. Uh, I haven't gotten to see these films in fullness. Um, my connection is with Stephen, uh, as I would say, a friend and soul tender. So seeing this film this time, I saw the archetypes so strongly, especially between men and women, especially. And, uh, you know, the, the trashing of the woman and her seeking the knowledge and the keeping it away and uh, all those patterns that are so obvious to us now, we're all uh, trying to soften the isms of all kinds now. It was interesting that he, he showed that as being a film that he made as a child. Yes, and, kind of and that his own so child so made it. <laughs> you know, as you both were saying, who knew him so well, uh, his authenticity, the authenticity of a man bringing his own child into his film. Yeah, he's, so his son Orion was playing him in... That was uh, Orion. Yeah. And then to have it have that content and have it be, yes, I'm trying to make a film, this little boy, and no one seemed to like it. I liked it. I thought it was good. <laughs> you know, the, the authenticity of him to do this was so... I love your use of the word brave. It was so real. And I'm encouraged myself, I'm 74, and I'm just beginning filmmaking. And it's an expression of authenticity that I use it as a wisdom-keeping grandmother. So, uh, yeah, Thank I you. encourage other comments. Yeah, that little film within the film, it's, uh, it's so much the childhood of filmmaking itself. Mm. Okay, any other reflections? Let's move on then to the next films we're gonna see, The Water Circle, The Bed, and Devotions. So let, let's just talk about it for a second. So The Water Circle is an example of one of his poem films. My favorite of his poem films, I think, is Four in the Afternoon, and that's viewable on YouTube. He made that in 1950 or 51, and it kind of took Europe by storm. He went, played it at Edinburgh and lots of other film festivals. 
uh, and people said we've never seen anything like this. Um, but the, the water circle um, he made when in 1975, so right after Testament. And it's interesting that both that, that film and maybe the water circle, he had just met Joel, is that possible? Because he thought Testament would be his last film. And then he met Joel Singer and the two of them made eight more films together. Yeah, I think he, he met Jewel right after he made Orogeny, and then they made Song of the God Body together, which I think is the, uh, I think that's an amazing, I mean, uh, Song of the God Body kind of takes Orogeny to the next level, I think. And, um, I think we put that on YouTube and they didn't censor it, even though there's <coughs> some <laughs> sperm in it. Um, uh, because it, it's Joel kind of making love with his camera to James's body. And James wrote the poem, Song of the God Body. He had this concept of the God Body that we should all look at our bodies as temples and we should worship our own and each other's God Bodies. Uh, but the water circle is really part of his Zen, uh, Alan Watts mm -hmm. influence period that Jason talked about last night. Uh, the Bed, of course, his most famous film, the only one that ever made money, um, made in uh, 1967, but it came out here in 1968. Uh, he, he had stopped making films for 15 years, and this uh, Belgian film festival director sent him some color film stock and said, I want a film from you for my festival in December. So in the summer of love, James and his friends created the bed, and that was not a new idea for him. I found in his archive at Kent State notes that he had made in the 50s about using oh, wow. the bed as a stage and using the bed, and he wrote a play called Bedlam, which is also about four different couples in bed. Uh, so, as Cordy said, it's really an experience, and you have to think, okay, this was made in 1967 when there was no nudity to be seen. Um, and he does it so playfully, and it's almost like it doesn't matter that these people are nude. It's important, but um, I don't know. And then Devotions is the one that might push more people's buttons because it has some, it's mostly men making love with men, men doing things with each other. Um, but he and Joel, went around and created these little tableaus. The bed is a series of tableaus, and devotions is a series of tableaus uh, with their friends. And they always co-created these. They, it, wasn't, they were, it wasn't like they were directing their friends particularly. They would talk with their friends over wine and figure out what they were going to do the next day. And then they would create these little scenes. So. I, I would just add, you know, since I teach uh, mostly people in their 20s who many of them can't really even remember when there wasn't legalized gay marriage. I mean, they literally have a hard time knowing that it wasn't always easy to be openly gay. Um, and I think that makes this film even more remarkable, 1983. Uh, it's a celebration of men and gay men's sexuality and each other and just men's bodies. Um, you know, we kind of live, we come, we're, we're in a country that was founded by uh, religious extremists, Puritans, Calvinists, et cetera, and that's kind of had a long effect on our country and uh, people's feelings about their bodies. Uh, and sex, and I think James was just always pushing the envelope. Beautiful, thank you. Anything else? Let's watch, let's, let's get into it. Take us somewhere, James. Flute on the right. <laughs> wow. And, and the 
man with him is his husband, Bill Kolvik. Yes. And, um, that's their relationship, I think, the James and Joel's relationship with Lou and Bill is a great relation, is an example of the kind of creative relationships that they had with many of their friends and other artists. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, I, I'm only a little sad that we didn't get to see one of the films that Joel has a little bit more of Joel's aesthetics in it um, because they uh, were great inspirations to each other. And I think uh, true. their love really, I think, launched James's art into a whole nother level. And, the Gardener uh, of Eden, for example. The Gardener of Eden is a beautiful, yeah, and you mentioned Scattered Remains. Those are, I think, kind of my two favorites of their collaborations. And, um, but you can, I, for me, I mean, just the, uh, uh, just the uh, caring and tenderness in the whole film, I think, you know, just captures so much of their relationship and just being around the two of them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and they, uh, they did inspire that in other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think to know James or to see this last film and to see him with Joel and Joel with James, uh, just to, I don't know, just such a loving couple. Um, yeah, just, um, and James, uh, Joel, who, you know, has gone on to live, you know, he's still, he lives in Bali now. Um, he's had other, you know, partners in love, but you can tell there, from, at least from my point of view, James has just been the love of his life. No question, and in fact, the gravestone that you see in the uh, cemetery in Port Townsend that says adventure, not predicament, on the top, uh, <coughs> has room for Joel uh, under James's name. So he's had two relationships with older men and one with a woman since James died. And, um, but you're right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think one thing that hit me watching Devotions again today is, um, you know, I think I made the comment like, well, we're sort of used to seeing all kinds of things now. But there still has been kind of a taboo with seeing men nude. And that is in Hollywood, that is still the ratings boards. Um, it's sort of a thing that I think people just, it's just something we don't see a lot of, other than, you know, people that say you live with or whatever, but um, we just don't see it so much in the media. Yeah, I found the shaving scene a little hard to watch, but... Um. <laughs> yeah, I kept thinking it looked a little dangerous. <laughs> What about, did anybody notice that he has kind of a foot fetish? I was wondering that he's definitely giving equal time to foot fetishes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, you know. I, nothing James <laughs> ever said to me, anyway. <laughs> Cordy, any, <laughs> any insight here? Any insight? So what about the bed? Why do you think that film struck such a chord? Well, I can just throw a theory out, but you know, I think Summer of Love definitely. There, it's just the right time it's for the this film. The quintessential hippie film. But there, there's also a thing. Okay, back to me teaching film history. Uh, we were uh, basically all of Hollywood was controlled by the production code, which started in the 30s, and it didn't really end till around 1968, I think. Or, I mean, it got looser and looser in the 60s. But there were all these uh, constraints on uh, basically what, you, what was deemed moral and what could be seen. Uh, nudity, definitely. One of them, um, you couldn't depict gay people. Um, just, I mean, on and on. I'm not gonna do the whole thing on the production code, but it sort of ended right around this time of this film. The bed came out. And I think people just were kind of starved along with what was happening in the culture. Uh, free love, um, Vietnam, people questioning, you know, their government. Uh, 
marijuana. So, marijuana, civil rights. I mean, there's just something about a whole kind of loosening up and change in the culture, and this film just hit, uh, I think, right on the cusp of that change. I think the film, it, it also kind of celebrates the uh, independent cinema. You mentioned the code in the, but um, it, in uh, Hollywood production, there's, uh, it's so, um, so much has to be uh, developed beforehand to get money to make a film. You have to have a script, you have to sell the script. So much of it is, is set in stone before you even start. And I, I think in this, uh, movement that James was really, you know, one of the, you know, great heroes of. Um, it was called independent cinema. It was called underground cinema, experimental cinema, avant-garde, avant -garde, personal cinema. I mean, they're all, but I, I think quintessentially, it, um, you know, people were making films with their friends on a shoestring, and uh, it allowed a tremendous. Uh, freedom to, and, and I think that freedom is really, uh, you can see it in both uh, devotions and in the bed. It's you're just getting together with people and anything goes. And uh, I think one of the things uh, in the uh, little uh, book that I mentioned, Seeing the Light, James's book on filmmaking, that was really important to me is that. Um, he suggests the word composing instead of the word editing. And really, if you're, if you're working on a Hollywood film, it is editing. You, you've, got, you've shot something with, you know, with a story and you're picking and choosing the best of it. But really, um, in independent cinema, some of my favorite films, I think, are they're composed and they're really you shoot maybe with a notion and a vision, but the film is really brought together when you, uh, and that's really uh, a freedom that you hardly ever have with a, a large budget in a film. Mm -hmm. Were either of you influenced by James in terms of your own filmmaking? Uh, I would say for me, uh, I mean, sort of my kind of two real guys in, the, uh, in that era were um, James and Bruce Bailey. And I think probably more directly by Bruce Bailey's aesthetic, but I was certainly influenced very strongly and inspired by James in just the spirit and love joy and desire for making it. I think uh, I, I only had seen The Bed, um, and I kind of really came, I mean, in college, as I mentioned, I came more out of abstract painting and sculpture into my film work, uh, and was probably maybe more influenced by someone like Norman McLaren, but a uh, Canadian animator. Um, but interesting, as we watch The Bed, which is the one film I've seen, I have one film where there is a bed on wheels uh, being wheeled. It's, it's a, through a kind of rural setting. It's all black and white, though. It's much more uh, dark and morose feeling. Um, but it never really occurred to me, like, did that bed idea come from years before having seen The Bed? Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't surprise me if it was sort of in my subconscious. Mm -hmm. um, used in a very different way, though. Janice made one of my very favorite films, I Am the Night. Is that the title? Yeah, that's it. it. I yeah. Am the Night. And uh, it, I think she alluded to it before. It's uncannily like one of James's films. And I think it was one of the reasons that James yeah. kind of felt so connected to you. It was, yeah, I, yeah, it's just odd. So there's some, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, there's some connection I felt with James, but I think his m mentorship to me was in a different kind of form. Great, well, let's see if there are any questions from the audience um, about 
anything about our relationships with James, one of the things that was interesting to me that he said was, it's more important to live poetically than to be a good poet. And um, I, I, I don't know if that, I think that his films were partly about living poetically. Here are some images to show you what it looks like to live poetically. Yeah, I, th I think um, along with that, um, there's something about, I mean, you see him, images of James in many of his films because I feel like he himself or his, his life was as much art to him as the poems, as the films, that there's, and I, and I think any artist, uh, don't lose sight of your own life. There's many very obsessive artists, and maybe you have to be a little obsessive to be an artist, but don't obsess so much about your art that you lose sight of your life. Beautiful. Are there any questions or comments from the audience? Oh, good. Okay, Jason's taking the microphone. Uh, okay, question is very simple. Uh, since we have, uh, we saw different types of videos, poetry videos, sometimes narrative videos. So what was his methodology or how his um, scripts look like or, uh, you know, storyboards, how he would go in this uh, journey of a production of one movie and of course probably there is difference a uh, different type of approach for uh, all these different movies my sense is he didn't have any one formula but well i i'm going to give the nod to you because you're way more the historian but it's my kind of uh you know fantasy of um devotions in both the bed that they were you know, hugely spontaneous and collaborative with the people, uh, um, ask, you know, asking them what they wanted to do. And, you know, sometimes, I'm sure James had a lot of notions, but I don't, uh, you, you know, and, and his films are, are uh, they're very different, some of them. Uh, from each other. From each other. <coughs> uh, Dreamwood, one of my favorites. Is, Maybe uh, his is, longest film. is his longest, one of his most ambitious. It's pretty scripted, um, but... Um, and that's his most Jungian film. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and probably, and uh, just, I don't know, back to kind of the independent way of working, uh, uh, I like to think of it as more dreamlike, whereas the you know, bigger productions we see are more more like mythology. They're much more collective, and you know, the uh, auteur, the director, maybe the writer is tuning into you know the myths of our culture and making it his own. And I think it goes both ways. But in the independent cinema, like the individual dream, uh, it. Uh, and what was the name of the class that you uh, worked with him on? Oh, the, the name was called um, uh, uh, Beginning Soul Making Introduction to Art and Life, mm. which I've always really liked. <laughs> and his book, Seeing the Light, which was later released under the title Making Light of It, um, mm. is really a guide to life as, much, as well as a guide to filmmaking. Very much so. And, and much you so. can get a free copy of Seeing the Light on our bigjoy.org website. Um, we have it there. Uh, as a PDF. So there was another question or comment down here. Uh, in, uh, toward the end of your documentary... Uh, Sorry? Oh, toward the end of your documentary, there's a section uh, where... Is it James talking about or someone talking about James saying that uh, you're always pretending? Um, and I'm curious... Uh, about your thoughts on that, because that was uh, such an interesting part of the film for me. Like it, it really yeah, he says of... everything is an act. Yeah, uh, which really surprised me when he said that. Um, but I think on some level, he, yeah, that's where he says, um, "Always say you're fine. It makes your friends happy and makes your enemies furious." 
Um, I was surprised when he said that. <laughs> Do you think he thought everything was an act? Well, I, I think uh, one of the things I remember about James is that he always had like a lot of hats, a lot of costumes. I remember over at his house, and he couldn't cook without putting his chef's hat on. And I, I think in a way, it's um, he was very good at evoking the gods. There's you know archetypal energies out there, and um, uh, and he also says about originality that it, it's not about newness or, you know, particularly being uniquely yourself. It's about origins, you know, and um, uh, I think that's, um, y you know, in that, s in that sense, I think you... Uh, I I mean, we can't help but act, and if we're aware of that, then I think, you know, we are being very authentic, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, we are playing all these roles, we're like complex characters, mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, I think this sort of, you know, in a way, there's a, you know, kind of a myth of authenticity, and it's way deeper, more authentic to, you know, just be aware of what character you're playing. And, you know, and I think his example of just say, uh, you know, I'm fine, I love that you ended the film with that. I mean, I think that's pretty telling. Yeah, in that last interview that we used in the film, we did five months before he died, and he knew it was his last interview. And actually, Galen Garwood made a lovely 10-minute film called Letters from James that you can see on YouTube, uh, which is based on that interview that uh, James asked me to interview him. And you see in Big Joy that one scene where I'm there talking to him. Uh, but he, he was very aware that he wanted to show that he was still joyful even in his last months. And uh, he tried to live up to the name Big Joy. And the whole idea of ritual, um, many of his films feel ritualistic to me. And those little scenes in devotion seem like they're all little rituals of sorts. Well, any, anything else that needs to be said before we, we head out? We can continue this discussion a bit in the lobby. But there is one more. It looks like Norma Jean is itching to say something. <laughs> yeah, itching, you bet. Because this is such a feeding to our souls, you know. And, and who, I have to say this, who could watch devotions and not be aroused? <laughs> In a very human way. In a most human way. And so uh, I would like to offer a deep gratitude to all three of you. And uh, we can continue in the lobby or however it goes into our lives. Uh, but the bringing of meaning, uh, you have contributed towards. And I think all of us as human beings have a job of bringing meaning to our lives. And I personally try to bring the most meaning to every moment. And sometimes that's a lightness of meaning. Uh, I want to thank you three, and I'm sorry that we aren't alive in a time where we would have naturally come down close mm. and be in the small circle of intimacy that we have the privilege of being a part of here. And I want to thank both of you experts who are in this world of meaning and film and humans for coming and offering what you have. You've given such a richness. And Stephen, of course, for the way you've lived your life, your authenticity with James is obvious. Thank and you all. I learned a lot about that. Giving. All right, dears. And I love what Jason said last night about 
these empty seats all represent ancestors. And so our ancestors are here with us. And I'm very grateful uh, to James and to many other ancestors. And speaking of gratitude, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to give a special thanks to the staff and volunteers at the Vashon Center for the Arts. It's just been a true joy to work with all of you, uh, with Allison and Joe and Dara, with Michael and Ben, who have been making sure that everything's working here th throughout this process, with Ellie and Maria and Lynn Ann. Um, I also want to thank the Vashon Heritage Museum for co-sponsoring this whole weekend, Big Joy Weekend. Um, Elsa Kroonquist, who's the executive director, Bruce Hallman, um, Ellen Kritzman, my co-curator for in and out being LGBTQ on Vashon Island, which I hope you can see. It'll, it's up till mid-May, at least. Uh, Mike Suddeth and Cyrus Anderson. Uh, I also want to thank Jason Jen again for bringing uh, a manifestation of kind of taking James Broughton to the next level um, and giving, inspiring us all. And if you, uh, the song of the bed, which we didn't get to hear in the movie because the movie has no words, uh, was done twice last night by Jason in just gorgeous form, once naked. Uh, and I want to thank my partner and soulmate, Gordon Barnett, who has supported me through this whole process. Um, and as well uh, is out there behind the table with wonderful Big Joy merchandise. Uh, I want to thank Joel Singer for giving us permission to use all of James's material at no charge. Um, he's, I think, wanting to FaceTime with us after this. Um, <laughs> I want to thank James Broughton, of course, and James Shaberg, a new Vashonite who has uh, helped me with some of the technical things, as well as putting up the posters that are out there outside the Vashon Center for the Arts. So thank you all again. Have a wonderful evening. Bring a little more joy to your own and each other's lives. And I'll end with one more poem. Uh, this is it. <laughs> this is really it. This is all there is, and it's perfect as it is. There's nowhere to go but here. There's nothing here but now. There's nothing now but this. And this is it. This is really it. This is all there is, 